wanted to welcome you to the second dialogue. Uh, this dialogue, the goal of this dialogue is really to unpack the theme of this conference, which is reimagining prosperity in post-conflict settings. So that's going to be the specific framework that we're going to use and continue to unpack for this panel. Uh, I'm Kate Mitty. I've been with Build Peace since the beginning, since conference one five years ago. And I've been really excited to see how it changes and grows. And I'm really honored to be with all of these awesome individuals uh, who we had a great conversation yesterday that a few of you, I think, overheard in one of the classrooms <laughs> as sort of a starting point. Uh, but some of the things that we really talked about is this concept of prosperity and how do we start to unpack it as we know that we all come from different contexts and this concept of prosperity is very, like many things in the world, very contextually specific. Uh, and so how do we use this panel as a chance to start to unpack that and also ground it within each person's sort of individual perspective and exper experience, but also the work that they're doing at the same time. Uh, and that is really the goal of this panel for us. The other piece that we really wanted to build in is we wanted to make it a dialogue and a conversation with all of you. Uh, so we're going to be trying a little bit of an experiment that I'll bring in later. Uh, but what we wanted to do for the first sort of five, ten minutes is set the foundation so that you know enough about everyone that's up here that you can have a conversation with all of us and we can start to continue to unpack this thematic theme and make it sort of a dialogue with this room. I think this room's small enough that it gives us a chance to try and experiment and continue to sort of build this and unpack it from different directions. Uh, so I wanted to start with a basic sort of question. Uh, can you just tell us who you are, where you're coming from, and what you're energized right now within your work, and a bit about your work? I'm sorry. <laughs> or wherever. Anyone can say. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Aline. Um, I am originally from Lebanon, born and raised in New York City. Um, my background is mostly has been mostly in journalism, focusing on human rights. And I'm actually here uh, representing Natakalam, uh, which means we speak in Arabic, and is a social enterprise that I uh, co-founded, my co-founder sitting in the back over there, three years ago. Um, and the idea for Natakalam stemmed from seeing this overwhelming number of Syrians come into Lebanon uh, after the uh, conflict that began and actually realizing uh, the complexity of, of what it means to be a refugee and how refugees, for the most part, the millions who have immediately crossed borders, uh, they're actually uh, barred from access to the local workforce. Uh, at the same time, I was myself working on my Arabic, and my Arabic is not the best, and I was looking for a way to practice Arabic from New York City back then. Um, and I had always want, wanted to go to Syria to study Arabic. Uh, Damascus is known in, in the journalist uh, circle as one of the best places to, to learn Arabic. And then I thought to myself, um, well, since I can't travel to Syria, and since there's so many Syrians in Lebanon and they can't actually legally work, what if they became my language partner um, over the internet through um, the, the now famous uh, gig economy? So um, based on that premise, uh, Natakalem came to life, and so we're a social enterprise, and we use technology in its most basic um, sense for the most human uh, means and connections. Um, and I think I can stop at that, yes? Perfect. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Sarah McLaughlin. Um, I am from Northern Ireland. I work in a town called Balamina, which is about 40 minutes from here. Um, I work for a charity called Mid and East Antrim Age Well Partnership. Um, so we work predominantly with the older uh, people's community in Mid and East Antrim, so that covers Larne, Carrick and Ballymena. Um, I am a project officer for a project called Piecing Ages Together, and that is a, a project devised by our charity, Mid and East Antrim Mutual Partnership, um, and funded by the special EU programmes body, so it's part of the Peace 4 funding um, that comes into Northern Ireland. Um, a £270 billion fund which helps Northern Ireland across various areas. My strand is within building positive relations. So our charity devised this project basically to look at um, the older people's community and um, to see how we could basically develop an age-friendly cross-community programme between the three towns. The three towns were recently um, amalgamated into a super council um, so you have older people from various different rural and um, urban areas in Mid and East Antrim 
who have never been to these towns before. They've lived in their little villages and towns um, and they've lived in their religious communities. So down through the troubles and the conflict, they've been very segregated. Um, but this is a new era for them and um, we, we work in our charity to empower older people um, and to show them that there is new possibilities and new abilities in life. Um, so we wanted to show them basically through our project that they can get out and about, they can um, not be lonely, they don't have to be isolated in their homes, they can have a new um, horizon, they can develop new skills and abilities. Um, so we have 15 partnerships, so we took 30 community groups from our area from various different towns and locations and religious backgrounds. Um, we mix them together into 15 partnerships and then those 15 partnerships take part in social activities together. So very like what uh, Lord Alderdice was talking about yesterday, we're trying to develop new personal relationships between people of an older age and intergenerational work as well through the medium of culture and arts and sports and history um, and ethnic minority themes as well. Um, so we're showing them that they can spend uh, 26 hours in total together over the course of the next few months um, doing something completely different, sometimes pushing them out of their comfort zones, um, having, for example, 80-year-old ladies trampolining for the first time in their lives, um, having an 88-year-old lady doing circus skills, um, so showing them that there's real new possibilities out there and also starting the conversation about their similarities and their differences through the years that they have lived through um, and how they can unite really as one. Hi, I'm uh, Brendan McCourt, CEO of New Red, a production company based in Belfast. I'm a journalist and filmmaker. And uh, for many years I worked for BBC Current Affairs making investigative documentaries about the troubles here and the transition to peace. And really one of the things that drove me was really to try and find the truth for many of the victims of our conflict. And that still goes on today. But I've also tried to balance that with um, working with disadvantaged groups along the peace lines, young people and women. And I've been using virtual reality as a tool to do that most recently. Hello, my name is Harriet Adong and I come from Uganda, Northern Uganda. It's a post-conflict community that uh, survived the war for over two, 20 years, that's about two decades. And my background is in gender and human rights. I'm a community activist as well. And I'm the executive director of a community-based organization known as Foundation for Integrated Development. And basically what we do, our focus, our passion is to support women and children who are survivors of sexual gender-based violence, conflict-related sexual gender-based violence. So we've been in existence since 2005 and uh, we've just started embracing the use of technology to share and tell the stories of the survivors of sexual gender based violence in my community. Thank you. Cool, thank you for that introduction. Uh, so, we talked a lot about yesterday over coffee this idea of reimagining prosperity, uh, and especially in a post conflict setting. And I, I think what struck me a lot is all of you sort of talked about what does prosperity mean within your context, uh, but also we sort of talked about like, is this a powerful term? I mean, does it give you sort of tension and opportunity to start to think about what can be new or what can be different? Or uh, does it sort of challenge you? Or is it not as much of sort of an energizing term? And uh, do we need to sort of reframe that question and sort of reframe that entire concept of reimagining prosperity? Uh, what I wanted to ask each of you is if you can sort of talk about what prosperity means within your context and what, how this sort of term and this like phrasing around reimagining prosperity means within your perspective and sort of from your perspective and from the work that you're doing at the same time. And while you think about that for one minute, uh, what I wanted to do was set up the experiment that we all talked about running, uh, which is we wanted to have some guest visitors from the audience uh, and from the delegates that are here join us on stage, this quasi-stage. 
Uh, and so if you have a question and you want to interact and engage, you can take the chair that's next to Harriet and come up and ask a question uh, and join us for a question for, so that we can sort of expand this dialogue beyond all of us too. So if you've got a question, come up and join us for the first question too. Does anyone want to take a stab at that conversation around prosperity? Um, well, I, I'll go first. Yeah. Um, whenever I first saw the question, I sort of threw me a little bit and couldn't get my head around prosperity and older people and what does that really mean and you know you normally think of economy and wealth and things like that but um, whenever I really thought about my groups when I'm out working with all of those groups and um, the fact that from the very outset of the programme we took those people and asked them what they wanted what they wanted to do, what activities they wanted to do, who they wanted to meet, what were their fears and their worries or concerns, why did they want to apply for the funding. Um, I realised that it's just defined by them in those answers. So it's the prosperity for our older people's um, groups is really about their health and well-being. Um, we wanted to tackle loneliness and that's one thing that we realised that there's people the, pe the people are sitting in their houses for days on end they're maybe only speaking to someone in a supermarket once a week um they're 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 desperate for their good morning calls that we organize for them you know things like that are so important they need a sense of connection um you know and these projects that we're devising are giving them an opportunity to get out and meet other people and to allay those concerns about and fears about meeting new people. Um, so everyone needs a connection in life, whether you're six or 60 or 86. Um, and I think the older you get, that's more important. That connection is, is so important. So the definition really for me was defined by them. Um, and it's really their health, their well-being, so the whole holistic idea of health. Um, how they feel about themselves, so being able to develop their self-confidences again and those new abilities that we're trying to push them into. Um, and also just giving them that opportunity really and reawakening that ability. So yeah, we're trying to show them that there's a new prosperity in life in older age. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah, I think that that was one of the things that I remember you talking about yesterday, is you talked a lot about how prosperity for the community that you're working with mm -hmm. is getting out of your house on a day and sort of testing out and sort of trying something new, mm -hmm. uh, which I think can be different than what prosperity might mean, for instance, for me in Boston, mm -hmm. which might mean, you know, prosperity <coughs> might mean like a more sort of intermixed community, which I think, mm -hmm. you know, is the prosperity that we're sort of aiming for and shooting for, which I think is mm -hmm. helpful to start to contextualize that. Harriet, do you want to go next? Because I think you were one of the, like, the the vocal components around rethinking uh, or critiquing or sort of challenging or questioning this idea of reimagining prosperity. And I was curious what it means yeah. to you. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. I think for us as a, a, a country and um, as the people of Uganda, we're still grappling with the whole concept of prosperity. Our ruling government now has a slogan, prosperity for all. But we're still asking ourselves, what do you mean by prosperity? First of all, the whole cause, our conflict was caused by a divide between resources and the political aspects as well. But you find that, this, that the difference is still there. The pie is not shared equally. When I talk about the pie, I don't know if you get it. The cake that we, we have. We're not equally sharing this cake in terms of resources. And the government says there is prosperity for all. So when I saw this uh, theme for this year, it still trickled my mind and with the groups of the women that we work with. So we're questioning ourselves, what is prosperity anyways? And the whole aspect of reimagining, what are we reimagining? Are we rethinking? Are we recreating? Those are some of the concepts that we were asking ourselves. What do we mean by reimagining? Do we have a mental a visual in our head and start thinking, okay, this is where we are now and this is where we were? But is there a change with where we were and where we, where we are now and where we were before? Is the change there? Are we seeing any change? And then, what is prosperity? Does it mean because I have a job, I'm prosperous? Because we have infrastructures? 
Does that mean prosperity? Because for the context now we ask ourselves, just because the guns are silent, does that mean we're prosperous? Does that mean because we have infrastructures, we're okay? Just like you have noted, I think it's more than just to know that we have a job, you have an income. There is more to that. There is aspect of the mental aspect, the psychosocial support. And that's a big issue for us, especially for the women that we support. These are women who are still struggling with their psychosocial support aspect. Inside, they're, they're struggling. On the facial, they can look like, yeah, they're prosperous. But there's much into that to just know that how do we define prosperity? I think for me, it's not just about having income or having infrastructures. It's more to that. And that's something we need to rethink and think deeply about uh, defining the term prosperity in the times of uh, conflict. Because when you look at how conflict affects us all, it's different. The people in the rural communities and the people in the urban space, they were affected, yes, but probably those in the urban centers have moved on very well. But those in the rural communities are still struggling. They, have, they need spaces to tell their stories. They need spaces to heal, you know, individual healing first of all before you look at the community level. So I'm still grappling with the concept, but for me, I think it's something probably at the end of this discussion is something we'll have to either request you, we think. Um, it's something I'm looking forward to probably at the end of, 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 of this conversation. Yeah. No, I mean, of, of course, it, it's important to, I mean, the, the term prosperity um, is very relative. Um, what's interesting uh, from our experience with Netakalam is the original premise for Netakalam was that we need to give um, access, refugees need access to an income, they also need access to kind of a, a sense of purpose, right? Uh, refugees' lives are almost defined by idleness, by waiting, waiting at borders, waiting in refugee camps, waiting for UNHCR to get back to them, which really doesn't happen that often, um, sadly. Um, so, you know, I think that um, it's, it's really interesting. So the original idea was, was that, but recently when we surveyed um, the refugees that we work with, what they ranked as the highest, um, kind of what made them most excited um, within their work with Netakalem was actually the human connection and the access to the world through their small screen, their computer screen. Um, and so, you know, that was really, um, for them, it's almost like prosperity is actually having the opportunity to not be seen as a refugee anymore, to be seen as a language partner, to be seen as a Syrian, not a Syrian refugee. Um, and I think, you know, it really speaks to the political climate in which we are living today. I mean, being a refugee, unfortunately, is um, affiliated with really negative um, stereotypes and even more being a Syrian refugee. Uh, so I think um, really for the refugees that um, we've been working with, um, that possibility to share their story, to connect with people across the globe who only hear about them through the media and political spheres, um, that's almost giving them a sense of prosperity, of social inclusion to reclaim who they are. Um, Open up for your question. Thanks for joining us and being the first <laughs> guest. <laughs> Brendan, you're on. Okay. Yeah? Oh, okay. Or, or we can ask a question. Either way. I don't whatever you're talking I'll address yeah. the question <laughs> okay. imagine prosperity. So, first thing I should say is probably 90% of Northern Ireland is quite normal nowadays with the peace process and so on. Um, but Maybe just a couple of miles from here, we have some of the most poor and disadvantaged areas in Northern Ireland. That's around the peace lines. And um, for people in those areas, and particularly young people, prosperity means having a job. But more than that, it also means being free from the threat of violence and control, which exists in those areas. The paramilitary groups still exist on all sides and they exert control on the community. Um, they deem themselves to be the police. And the way they do that is, is 
some young kid is accused of housebreaking or burglary, they go along and they shoot him in the legs as a punishment. And just by way of example, a couple of recent examples, it's so endemic in that community that mothers actually bring their sons by appointment to the gunmen to be shot. Another example recently was where one young guy, paramilitaries were after him to punish him. Um, they couldn't get hold of him, so they shot his parents instead. So that's how brutal it is. So I would say for those people in those areas, a job would be great. Um, but more than that, it's being free from threat of violence control. I think that's a really helpful setting. I think it starts to challenge something that I think can be really clean when you sort of look at it. And probably when you look at it, uh, even within the context of uh, promotional sort of information, that like prosperity, I think sometimes can be clean. It sounds like it's been very politicized mm -hmm. in Uganda right now, just given the governmental campaign around it too. And so <coughs> similar to some of the peace conversations that I think we were having around this conference is like some of these terms that we intend to sort of make opportunity end up also having uh, political meanings around them and sort of powerful meanings around them. Uh, and also this need to start to understand what does prosperity mean for each person? What are the tactics then that push us in that direction? Uh, and also how do we start to think about like what is that direction sort of collectively? All right, I'm going to open it up for our first guest. I was, I was wondering how the conversation would change if we stop conceptualizing prosperity as a noun and mm -hmm. treated it as a verb, mm -hmm. as a process, and we stop talking about it is about what you have, but relative to where you're at, where you move, and how that feels like. And so just talking about a process rather than a thing. So I was wondering how that would you know, open that up. Yeah. Process therapy. <laughs> I think I can pick something from there. Uh, for me, I totally agree with you in terms of uh, embracing prosperity as a process. Because you cannot wake up in the morning and you say, now we're prosperous. It takes time. But also, as you're taking the time through, it's a process, yes. But then, how much time is the question now? How much time? You're also asking the time of the process. How long does it take you to say that I'm prosperous? Uganda has been in, we've had a president who's been in power for the last, I don't know, 30 something years. For those who know <laughs> the history about my country. And it's been the slogan year after year, year after year. And now the young people are stepping up and saying, we've had this story, this, this process of prosperity for the last 35 years. And you have to question it, how long, when shall we get to, to, the, to the age of saying now we are prosperous? Yes, it is a process. But also, like I said, it's, I think the process also starts with me. How do I take myself as prosperous? If myself, I am stuck in a box and thinking that prosperity will come from somebody, then I think I will, we shall lose that. It starts with me where you are. And for us, that's what we, start with, what we are pushing for with the women. Because we will not wait for the government to come and help them. They have to help themselves. Mm -hmm. they, as, 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 as women who are survivors of sexual gender based violence, they need to help themselves to see that they take themselves as prosperous. And that's why we have what we call community self-help groups. So they've started their process to help themselves to take uh, the path of, of prosperity within their space, within their communities, but at also an individual level. So for me, I totally agree with you. It's a process, but then you have to question. In terms of conflict, you know, it's if conflict has stayed there for 10 decades, and we're still in the same space, and there is nothing, there's no change that we're seeing. Like I said, the gun is quiet. But people, we're sitting like on a time bomb, because you can't talk, you can't say much. You, you have, if you come out, uh, I don't know how many of you have heard the history, what's going on in the country, in Uganda. At least I know someone uh, is, ha, had a story about the history, what's happening in Uganda. So even the context, the politics itself, 
How many of you are familiar with Uganda? I don't know. It's How many have heard something yeah. about Uganda? Okay. <laughs> so you can see that the context we are in itself, we, we've been struggling to get to that road. We've, we've taken the process of being very good citizens. Our democracy is, to say we are democratic and we're trying to get out of, to take through the transition process, it's very tricky because even now our transition justice <clears throat> policy has not been approved. And yet that's supposed to help us through the process. If, if to get to the process of prosperity, it's supposed to help us to uh, address issues of injustices, that uh, atrocities that were committed. So it's a process, but it's a long-term process. It, we have to decide how we want to get there. And for me, I think it's individually fast. If you're to wait for someone to take you there, it might take forever. Yeah. I think uh, for, for my group as well, it, it is about, you know, we've been very, very careful from the outset not to do to these communities and tell them what they need to do yeah. and what they're doing wrong. Yeah. Um, so my main aim was to sort of go out and they apply for their funding and then it's all about, right, what can you bring to this? Mm -hmm. So you're in a partnership and you may have one group, one community group, say, in Lauren, who has been running for 50 years and is very strong and... Um, maybe already cross community and a lot of my groups that I went out to were very cross at me asking them um, can you tell me how many Catholics and Protestants you have because they were like we're not used to being asked this question anymore and I, yes unfortunately we have to ask this question because it's peace money this is what this is about but they were already cross community so they are teaching me yeah. a lot of the things that we need to do. Yeah. Um, so instead of, as you say about the woman, instead of telling them, okay, this is what you need to do to be prosperous, mm -hmm. they're teaching each other and they're looking at their communities and seeing what they've got there if, if, to use mm -hmm. and how they can, so they, they have their groups, they have their partnerships, they have to nominate leaders, they have to manage their budgets. They have to decide on their timetables. They're already taking all of they've taken all of that ownership of the project, and then you know after my ten months is up with them, hopefully there'll be legacy there where they can keep on going with more little projects and maybe even apply for their own funding and not need people like me to be there as a middle person. I don't know if that's fine. Hmm? Either of you want to respond to that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, what's going on? On the ground here in the most deprived areas along the peace lines is that they're bringing young people together, youth groups and other groups like women's groups and that work is absolutely brilliant. You never hear about it but um, uh, it's really exciting to see what's happening because out of that you're having young people forming relationships across the peace lines, having children together and actually living in each other's areas and that is absolutely fantastic. Um, you don't often hear about it, but it is happening. So that's one of the really positive things that's happening in our peace process. I think what needs to be uh, it needs to be given more impetus by government and the private sector in trying to create employment in those areas, but also, as Sarah alluded to, uh, empowering the people themselves to do that and working with them. But um, that those things really will cement those relationships and keep people in those areas who, who are really willing to to live and work together. Mm -hmm. So that's a process that's ongoing here. Hmm. And Brendan, I want to pick up that a little bit because I think one of the topics we were having just before this conversation is that tourism is one of the key industries that's growing in Northern Ireland. Uh, and I think one of the questions that I think that I always have when it comes to thinking about like what are alternative economies is what are the vehicles that really start to make them alternative economies and by which I mean sort of ownership and also equity within that space and that was one of the conversations that we sort of had is like what are the industries and what are the vehicles within sort of existing and rising industries that create the space for building a new type of economy or starting to think about um, recognizing the inequities that oftentimes sort of exist within economies. Yeah, I mean tourism is one of our growing industries, it's doing absolutely brilliant. Um, but what I often hear from people in those areas, well, you know, the guides are bringing people to the peace lines, they're not from this area. 
we're not benefiting it in any way. So I think that there need to be more imaginative uh, ways of helping those people to reap the benefits of that tourism that's coming to their area. And um, you know, there are a lot of really talented people. We have a very rich culture. Um, and maybe there's some ways that that can be used to really show a bit of our culture to the tourists, but keep it within those areas at the peace lines. So I think there are opportunities there, and both government and the private sector should be should be taking the lead on that. Mm -hmm. But working with the local people to develop them. Eileen, do you want to respond to that? Because I think one of the pieces that strikes me a lot about your work is that it is really trying to think about what are the the social connections that need to happen, but also thinking about how does that how is that framed around economic possibility at the mm -hmm. same time? And yep, yeah. Um, yeah, no, no, so I think I'm, what I'm hearing a lot is about kind of, we're talking about human-centered design, kind of putting better fishery, which itself is going to be a complex term, at the heart of, of all the work, kind of going away from the top down and more from the bottom up. Um, and I guess just generally speaking as, as a startup, or like having my startup hat here and, and a social enterprise that really um, was a grassroots initiative. Um, so I think that that's definitely at the heart of a lot of how uh, social enterprises and, and startups uh, come to life. So really thinking um, kind of outside of the box, um, working with, you know, kind of in the NGO setting, we'll, we'll look at beneficiaries, right? I think the startup scene looks a little bit where the startup kind of approach is more like the beneficiaries are also your customers. So you engage them along the way. They have to be happy. You have to be in communication with them. And I think from you know our work, what we've really kind of also learned is um, yes, there's the, the social connections that we've um, we've seen develop uh, between between users, uh, both the refugees and the language learners. Um, and I think also what um, we've seen is um, the mindset in the social enterprise and startup setting is very um, you can be much very nimble, right? And kind of you're independent from um, thinking what your donors want, um, which sometimes can actually hurt your end goal. Um, so I think, you know, that in itself is an, an alternative way. And, and of course, talking about, I think we're bringing a lot of terms and analyzing them and, and thinking a bit uh, on the meta level. But I guess, yeah, in the most basic sense, um, alternative economies, like the idea of using the freelance economy um, is something that's starting to really pick up in the refugee space. Whereas up until recently, um, there was all these efforts to bring full-time employment, um, right? Because that is, of course, amazing. And that would be a great, um, if, if we could do that, it'd be wonderful. But that's really a big ambitious goal. And what we're noticing through our work is that just having refugees have a part-time opportunity, having a few students that, that motivate them to wake up the next morning. Because really, when you're looking at refugees and you know Natakelem works with kind of the middle class uh, population of refugees people who are you know who had their lives ahead of them who were educated um, professionals in you know architecture um, medicine uh, teachers artists etc and so what you see in, in, in a conflict zone is people who had a normal life and from one day to the next that that disappears, right? And so you have that fall, like that, you know, you, you weren't born into poverty, which is something that is catastrophic as well, but it's kind of a different experience, I think. And so being able to um, salvage to a certain extent that human capital that might be completely lost. And, you know, we saw the British Council's, um, you know, film about, uh, you know, what leads to, to war, radicalism, etc. It's no jobs and, you know, for people who study ISIS or radical groups, a lot of them recruit from the most talented and skilled populations who have lost all hope and have no sense of purpose. So I think, you know, there's a lot of those interesting layers to look, look at. Hmm. Harriet, you're writing furiously over there. Do you want to? <laughs> well, I think Uganda is also one of the countries that our tourism sector is really doing very well. For those that have been to Uganda, we have an amazing country. We're called the Pearl of Africa. And it's of recent that the activists under the Transitional Justice uh, Network are trying to advocate for how do we push for uh, 
tours into coming to the spaces of memorialization. Because mm. we have a history there, places where massacres were done. These are places that people can come and learn and understand the history of what happened in Uganda. And so one friend of mine was saying we should call it the black tourism. The black tourism. Yes, it's black. It has the concept of darkness. But it's tourism that can also bring in an income to within the economy. Because there's a huge history, Uganda's historical aspect of of war is was long all the way from the eighties. So there's a lot to learn about that and we, we don't have as much history, as much uh, visual to see and people come and see this as a tourist attraction. All people, all, every, the only thing that people come to see is the chimpanzees, the waterfalls, the dams, the amazing uh, <laughs> dams that we have and the animals, yes. But we also have that bit that is missing, that piece that is missing. Uh, for me, I think it's something that as a country, if we picked it up, it would also bring in an economy, uh, push for, for our economy development. And it's something that I've learned around uh, Ireland I, I, I here. There's a lot of history around that tells the story about the war and what happens and how the community is embracing this and how the community is living with through this. So I think it's something that uh, I, as a country we can also pick on. Uh, when you look at music, we have a lot of the music industry. How do we tell the story through music, the history of the war? It's, it's, it's an act that I think can also help us tell the story. For example, in the northern Uganda, we have uh, between the Cholis and the Langis, we have very strong musical aspect, traditional music. And if we could use this to tell our story, it would also be an aspect of tourism. Mm. So we tell our story of the war and the peace transition within the traditional music. So I think there is, there's a lot of alternatives of how we can embrace and uh, uh, push for the growth of our economies in terms of uh, prosperity, pushing for prosperity. Mm. Uh, I was thinking a little bit about it as you're talking about this is I think uh, there's this question for me around what are sort of the indicators of movement forward uh, I don't want to say success because I think it sometimes <laughs> simplifies it a lot uh, but I was thinking a little bit about within this conversation around reimagining prosperity and alternative economies which I think is oftentimes offering a different economic system that isn't just thinking about sort of singular ownership that's caught like uh, within a singular or sort of small set of people is really thinking about like what a different model of ownership and input is. Uh, but I think within that, how do you think about the indicators of progress in that space? And as you're developing your work, because I know that each of you uh, have different lenses on this, how do you start to think about like what is progress and what are you holding yourself to and what are you also responding to when you're thinking about developing the work that you're doing and developing sort of the economic model within that, uh, when you're thinking about sort of talking about sort of history, uh, when you're thinking about sort of responding to some of the gender work and also bringing in sort of intergenerational work at the same time? I think um, for our groups, it's, you know, knowing that they're ready to try. They're getting themselves out there so they're not holding back, so whenever I'm suggesting crazy ideas to them, they're not just, no, absolutely not, they're really ready to try something different, which is, you know, a really new perspective, which surprised me quite a bit. Um, but I think for my work in my project, the cross-community element was really quite easy. Um, but the challenges lay in the ethnic minority theme and um, Brandon and I were talking about this, the advent of Brexit in Northern Ireland is turning everything a little bit on its head and we're looking at a whole new set of circumstances. Um, so for my group primarily, I'm not going to be, pretend to be an expert on Brexit and the implications politically for Northern Ireland but everybody knows that Northern Ireland are at the crux of the the deal, no deal in the EU, um, but for my group primarily, going back to their idea of um, their well-being and security and their position in their community 
they're um, very fearful of the new Northern Ireland. And it's very sad to see that they were lived all the, their lives through a conflict in a very unsettled environment and then have had a very settled environment for the last 15, 20 years. And now all of a sudden they're dealing with a new dimension and they don't know how. Um, so for, for our charity going forward, even after this project, I think it's really about helping people, older people to understand the cultural diversity in Northern Ireland and understand the changing in their community and understand that it's, that they may be fearful, but it's just it's just change and, and that they can meet their new neighbours and that they can find out about different cultures. You know, so we have three partnerships doing their ethnic minority themes and um, we've got two very successful ones, one doing um, foods around the world, where we've got a group of ladies from a very rural environment in Brasheen and a group of ladies from Larne who are eating Russian and Thai and Bangladeshi food and they're loving it. And that's a really positive thing, but then we have another group um, from Balamina and Carrick Fergus who were supposed to be living a Thai culture, um, but had a major problem around the issue of religion. And as very strong Christians couldn't but couldn't, didn't feel comfortable in looking at Buddhist symbols and different religions and traditions that way, which was so disappointing. But it's the reality of Northern Ireland and that's the older generation's perspective. So I think for me, it would be trying to work on that cultural diversity going forward and, mm -hmm. and helping, helping them to understand their fears and the and concerns they have. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think what struck me a lot when you said that uh, was this complexity of responding to conflict that has been in sort of Northern Ireland and continues to live here, uh, but also being sort of challenged by things that are also coming in as mm -hmm. every entity is sort of moving and sort of shifting, and then what that sort of means for the tactics that you're starting to think about practically for uh, bringing <coughs> communities together and sort of bridging communities. and. Brendan, I know this is something that like you've talked a lot about too, is this mm -hmm. like need for intergenerational work, but also the need to sort of engage youth. And I was curious when you sort of think about the history and journalism work that you do, mm -hmm. what role you feel like it plays within um, post-conflict or, you know, however we use that language. I'm very thoughtful that sometimes that can be singular, but uh, how does it sort of work into it? Well, uh, the way I see it working is really getting to the truth. I mean, 25 years ago today, actually, um, it, Catholics were shot dead in a pub. They were actually celebrating Halloween. Um, and that was retaliation for a bomb on the Shankwell Road where 10 Protestants were killed the week before. So we're a long way from that now. So we are making you know, massive progress. Um, where I, the other positive change I see in this society is that we are uh, more tolerant of other people's rights, LGBT. We have a massive pride march in Belfast now. Um, and uh, in the Republic, they've elected a gay Taoiseach. So all of these things tell me that this island, at least, is moving uh, to a better place and young people really are part of, part of the driver of that change. Uh, they don't want to go back to the past, and all of that's positive. And I, you know, I've been using virtual realities and technology to bring people closer together as well, um, in terms of making a documentary about the views of young people who live on the peace line, and also an interactive experience where uh, people are able to, it's gamify, where you can knock down the wall and create something new in a, sh in, in a shared space. So people are willing to engage, and uh, young people in particular really are the drivers for change in this society. And I think the view is overwhelmingly positive uh, and going forward. And okay. looking to a better future, not just for themselves, but for, the, but for their children. All right, uh, anybody else want to join us? Any questions from the audience? Post lunch crowd is quiet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Okay. Uh, I wanted to build up that a little bit, but I think the one piece I wanted to understand is both of you, all of you are using technology at some point, and I was curious, like, what do you think the role of technology is in helping to, uh, well, I guess, complete the work that you're doing? That's what I was sort of thinking of. So, you're looking at me, so I am. Yes. <laughs> I'm giving you the stare down intentionally. Um, so, so, I mean, technology is, uh, is the enabler of what we do. Um, so it's, it's, it's funny because people say we're a tech startup and we're like, oh, we're not sure we're a tech startup. Uh, I mean, we've been using very, um, we launched using very uh, basic uh, technology. So t Skype, email, Google Forms. Um, but of course, technology is still at the core of everything we do because none of this would have been possible without the internet. And so we are using um, that connection to, to the world that refugees have to give them opportunities and, and connect them, even though as refugees, they, they can't really, I mean, it's funny because we think of refugees moving, but they're kind of immobile because every move they try to make, they're met with, you know, a barrier. Um, so even in, in those challenges, so for example, you know, the refugees who are in Lebanon, and we've worked with refugees in Lebanon who are constantly at risk of being stopped by the Lebanese army and being incarcerated, right? So they are stuck and, and immobile in a certain way, yet through the internet they are able to travel the world and to connect with people who, who learn Arabic with them. Um, so technology is at the core of what we do. I would say we're not a fancy tech uh, startup using AI and all these things. Uh, definitely not yet. Um, but of course, the human side of our work is really what is the, mo the, the most important. And what we see is, is human connections enabled by technology. But, um, but the human component is really critical to, to our work and, and to what we do. Cool. And just to build up that, I think the question that I had asked to folks before was this question of indicators of mm -hmm. uh, progress and success yes. that you sort of measure by. Sure. Uh, yeah. I was curious how that started and then just how that's changed throughout your process and yeah yeah so i mean we so 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 we're a startup uh social enterprise we have metrics of course that are kind of obvious metrics that one would think of which is you know we measure how many refugees are working with us how many language learners and we also our services are used in, in schools and universities as a complement to traditional language learning um, and we recently um, noticed that actually because people came to us asking for translation services delivered by refugees, we also offer uh, translation delivered by refugees because that's something they can do remotely. So we, of course, measure the amount of money we're able to disperse to mm -hmm. refugees. Um, we also, I mean, kind of the more subtle indicators that we look at and, and what we consider success will be, for example, for refugees who are you know, still in conflict zones or in the immediate bordering um, countries. Because I, I don't know how many people are familiar with third country resettlement, but basically um, there are about 65 million displaced people in the world today. Among those, there's a division between refugees, asylum seekers, internal refugees, internally displaced people. And then 1% of the refugee population actually gets formally resettled from a place like Lebanon to Canada or to Europe, um, to the US, even though that number is really just going down um, with our current president. But um, so the idea, we, we focus mostly on refugees who are in this limbo state trying to get resettled to Europe. And of course, the ultimate measure of success is if we have refugees who've worked with us, they've been able to sustain themselves living in this limbo status. and then ultimately get resettled. And we are able to support refugees in their application um, for resettlement. And, and so kind of looking at that comprehensive way, and even we have refugees who get resettled, for example, from Lebanon to Italy, but they get to Italy, they don't speak Italian. So they still use our platform to sustain themselves. So Netakelem really feels as um, we are a supporter to the transient moment that refugees are going through that can sometimes actually really help them survive and, and not completely just, you know, lose hope and lose any uh, potential to survive financially. So just, mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers um, the question somewhat. Yeah, that's helpful. I, I think it's interesting because I think a lot about, uh, I do a lot of work at MIT in the innovation and entrepreneurship space and 
we talk a lot about the critique of these oftentimes common indicators of success within ventures, which I think are a granular indication of an entire economy at the same time, which mm -hmm. is venture capital money raised, um, <laughs> number of people that are sort of served or employed, I think is the second one. Uh, and this conversation around like revenues raised, I think, and patents are like the four measures, main measures of success. And so what you're saying is it's not only about sort of the amount of money that we're raising, but it's also about these connections and it's about the amount of money that we're actually distributing. So yeah. that's like a model that's like very much built into your DNA of your organization that I think yeah. is interesting to start to juxtapose with this like idea of prosperity and alternative economies is what is sort of in the DNA of organizational or policy or programmatic models that starts to challenge, you know, exist or create sort of an alternative uh, space, I suppose. Uh, yeah. Um, indicators of success for me would be to change someone's mind and virtual reality is being used uh, in a really in innovative way I think at the moment where for example you can you're put on the headset and you're actually inside the skin of a black person I'm walking down the street and people start hurling you know racist and abusive comments at you and it'll let you know how it feels to be that person also, for example, a Muslim woman wearing a burqa or a gay person walking down the street. So uh, there are there have been proven instances where that has actually changed people's minds just to, to, to know what it feels like. Um, so that's how the power of technology can change people's minds. Another really great example I saw was, um, it's a virtual reality experience called The Enemy. I don't know if anyone here has ever heard of it. I know one person in the room has. And basically, uh, they what they did was they filmed a Hamas guy and an Israeli soldier in real time. They were in a room together, each just five yards from each other, or less, maybe like 10 feet. And each told his story while looking at the other one. And they actually filmed this in real time. And uh, then, so when you put on that headset, you're standing in the room with these two guys facing each other. When you walk up to one, he looks at you straight in the eye and tell, tells you a story. The mask guy's wearing the mask and the khaki uniform and has a Kalashnikov. The Israeli soldier is wearing his uniform and he's got a gun by his side. And this really happened and it's a really amazing thing to, to, to experience. You're, it's actually you're with these guys and you can feel the tension, you can feel the fear. Mm -hmm. The Israeli soldier's leg is actually shaking with fear. So that is really a powerful use of virtual reality technology to bring it as close to reality as, as can be. Mm. And it has the power to change people's minds and it does. Mm. So for me, that's the indicator of success. Yeah. I want to build up, because I went through the enemy when I was at MIT, and uh, one of the things that I found really interesting, and this is, I was curious about the work that you do, is like, what are the conditions for uh, a change outcome or sort of experience within that? Like what are the conditions for success when you're utilizing a technology like augmented reality or virtual reality? And so I was curious if you could talk about like what's sort of the wrap around reality experience around the reality, <laughs> you know, and just talk a little bit about what does that uh, experience look like? Because what struck me a lot at the enemy was that there wasn't room for a lot of reflection or a lot of dialogue. And so that experience was I interpreted it, sort of took it in, but wasn't able to really share that with other folks that were there as much. And so I was curious how that compares to the work that you end up doing. Well, well I can only speak as to how it affected me. Uh, you could feel the fear. It's almost like you were there. Uh, the, the recreation of these people, and they were three-dimensional. You could walk around them. So it, was, it just made it so real. So to me, it's as near to reality as you're ever going to get. Yeah. And um, it's going to get better, this technology. And uh, these are the benefits it can bring to people. Bring, bringing another experience, someone else's real life experience, inside you so that you know what it feels like. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right, so I think we're in the last five minutes, but any questions for each other that you want to ask? 
or secondarily, I was curious if you have questions or things that you're interested in learning from folks that are here, or like questions that you're sort of grappling with or thinking about within your work that... I'd be interested to hear from the audience. Maybe somebody has a question about some of the things we've been talking about in terms of conflict and transition and prosperity. <laughs> you can say from there. I was hoping the chair experience would work out, but it seems like... <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, well, Does anybody want me to repeat that? I know that. Okay. Um, uh, so I would say, I would summarize this and tell me if I captured this right, but I would summarize this as one. Oh my gosh, I forgot already. But there were two things there. <laughs> So who are you targeting, I think is the first question with them, technology. And I think the second question is, is like, if we're looking at technology specifically, like almost individually or within sort of a community space, like physical community space, if we're talking about it even here at like Build Peace, what do you think, at, what do you think is useful to understand and what conditions are useful to make that, make that successful? Is that fair? Yeah? Okay. So, which I think is probably thinking about like the technical aspects, but also the social aspects of it. Well, I'll answer the virtual reality question. Uh, who do you target? The decision makers or the people on the ground, I think is the question, is that right? The answer is both. And there's an example that has been done. Um, there was a virtual reality film made of a little girl who lived uh, a Syrian refugee, in a refugee camp and it really showed what her daily life was like and it was pretty grim and what they did with that film they took it to the decision makers at the UN to show them what it's really like for someone who's living in a refugee camp uh, but that film has also been taken out on the streets all around the world to show ordinary people uh, what it's like and to put them in the shoes of that little girl who's living in that refugee camp so you target everyone, who, both decision makers and ordinary people around the world who want to know more. So it's, it's a great tool for uh, letting people experience what it's really like. Well, for the case of uh, Northern Uganda, where I come from, as an organization, we've, uh, uh, we started embracing the use of technology and we started with a phone just a small phone, a smartphone. And it's because we're trying to create a space where, uh, how do we measure success? That's interesting one. Because it's been very hard to measure success in terms of people who are survivors of sexual gender violence, violence. Themselves to come out and tell you the story. It takes a lot of guts for somebody to tell you the story. 
So for us, measuring success is for the, the first step of even talking about it is a process of success for us. And when they agree to come on that small camera that we use, it's, it's a big step. Because if somebody wants to share the story on the small camera, I then want to tell the world what happened to them. So for us, using the phone has been our first step uh, because we're a small organization just growing. So we don't have the big gadgets that you could think about. But for us, we've taken a step, the phone. The mobile phone has been our step to tell the story of the survivors of sexual and nervous violence. But also in Uganda, there is an organization called Refugee Law Project. Uh, this is one of, I love that organization because they're doing amazing work. They've come up with uh, films to tell the stories at a bigger space. And we have, they've started also engaging in festivals as well, where we have film festivals and community screenings where people come and watch the stories. And then when we're having um, a moralization and uh, uh, sessions and uh, people telling their stories. So we have a, a session to watch this, these videos, these movies, the short documentaries they've made. So it's a learning for us as well as an organization because we work with them. We are part of the Transitional Justice uh, Network. So we're learning much of what they're doing. So at least they've done amazing work in terms of uh, telling the story to a bigger community. So I, I don't know if Brandon is here, at least you know are here. He, her RLP, Refugee Law Project, is one of the best, uh, he's been to Uganda and he does a lot of work with that organization. So they've done an amazing work in terms of documentary and filming. And as young organizations also learning, how do we help create a space where we start with a small community and help them tell their stories. So yes, it's not big, we start with very small gadgets, yeah. Cool, all right, so we are at time, but I want to say thank you to Harriet, Brendan, Sarah, and Aline uh, for joining us and highly encourage you to dig deeper into some of these conversations with these folks because I think there's a lot more to say than what's ever able to be possible within an hour. Um, Thank you.